Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is all about quadratic functions, and I think we're going to hit on a lot of review from Algebra 1, but don't worry if you feel rusty or you feel like you've never seen a quadratic function before, we're going to build you up from the uh, bottom up and teach you everything you need to know. We're going to do a lot of graphing tonight. We're going to talk about all the properties of this function. We're going to tell you how to figure out whether it opens up or down just by looking at the leading coefficient. We're going to talk about its turning point, axis of symmetry, y-intercept, x-intercept, and on and on and on. Now before we move on, I did bring in this function right here is the most famous quadratic of all time. So let's play that famous game called Can You Name That Quadratic Equation? Um, so just for fun, uh, for a little extra credit, um, sh have that written down in your notebook tomorrow and I'll come around towards the beginning of class and I'll jot it down and uh, we'll give you extra credit if you know the equation of this particular parabola. And the one thing that I appreciate about quadratic functions is they're great at modeling. Okay, there's a big buzzword this year that we're going to see more and more of. They're good at modeling many real-life scenarios. For instance, uh, you can imagine that you're standing up here on the top of the building and you, you grab a, a tennis ball and you throw it as far as you can and maybe this uh, quadratic models the path of that ball or perhaps you kick a soccer ball or a football and again the parabola is going to do a really nice job of modeling the height of that football and its trajectory. So a quadratic function is any function in the form f of x equals a times x squared plus b times x plus c, okay? Where the leading coefficient represented by the letter a is not zero. If a was zero, then it would uh, wipe out that whole term and then you'd only be left with bx plus c, which is linear, and that's not what we're talking about. Now, um, so the letter a is the leading coefficient uh, and then also B and C are also coefficients, but they're not as significant. Uh, this letter A is going to be very important tonight. Now the graph of quadratic functions form what is known as, and I, I bet you already said it, parabolas. And certainly they look like rainbows um, when they open down like this one does. And, and for instance, of course, the, so we're saying that this parabola opens down and it has a relative max sitting up there at the top. And let's say each parabola has a turning point, okay? And that turning point is either going to be a relative max, like the one on this picture is, or if we flip that parabola upside down, then it would be a relative min. And each parabola also has an axis of symmetry, which this picture also displays. Okay, our axis of symmetry is this dotted line that kind of bisects the parabola, it splits it in half, and it passes right through the turning point. Sometimes we also call that turning point its vertex. Now that axis of symmetry, like we just said, bisects the two zeros. And just to recap, another way, another word for zeros is the x-intercepts. Now there are three scenarios that I want to consider tonight with respect to our graph, specifically with respect to how many times it touches or crosses the x-axis. I'm going to assume that all my parabolas open up, but you could all easily make the same argument for them opening down. The first one is, and this is the one we see most commonly, is this parabola is going to cross the x-axis twice, and we would say that this equation has two real zeros. And the fact that they're real isn't a big deal yet. Later in the year we're going to introduce you to what's called imaginary numbers and we're going to differentiate between what's a real number versus an imaginary number. The second case is um, a parabola that touches the x-axis but then turns around. In other words, its vertex is sitting right on the x-axis and in that case we'd say there's only one real zero. And the third case, I bet you guessed it, is a parabola that never touches or crosses the x-axis even once. And in this case we'd say that there's zero real zeros, or none at all. Alright, we've really talked a lot about domain and range lately, and tonight's no exception. It's going to kind of creep into uh, so many of our videos. Now, regardless of whether the parabola opens down like this one does, or if it opens up like this one, what's going to happen is the graph extends infinitely to the left and infinitely to the right, and therefore the domain is what we call the set of all real numbers. It's kind of like a big fat capital R, or you could also say negative infinity to infinity if you prefer. Now the range, however, is going to depend on the turning point. So every time we talk about range, I'm gonna make we want to make sure we first know where the turning point is. So for instance, this one 
has a, a y max of 8, so I would say the range is from negative infinity to positive 8, and that's one good example where we're dependent on the turning point. If this turning point, and I'll just make up a number, let's say it was 2 comma 5, and in that case the y min is 5, and so I'd say the range is going to be from 5 up to infinity. And we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but the leading coefficient's a really big deal for us, and specifically we're going to focus on the value of a here. Now what we're saying here with this first picture is uh, when we say a is greater than zero, what we're really trying to say is that a is positive. And if that's the case, your parabola is always going to open up. Okay, just like this picture does here. That's what we call opening up. Now on the opposite of that is if a is less than zero, in other words, a is a negative number, that implies that the parabola is going to open down and kind of look like a, a frown, so to speak, here. Okay. All right, let's get into the guts of today's lesson and actually start doing some number crunching and some, some real math work here. We got all our definitions and stuff out of the way. Now, we want to evaluate these without using our calculator. And a quick reminder, our order of operation says that the exponent evaluation should be done first here today. Okay, so just keep telling yourself that exponent evaluation should be done first. And so to evaluate f of 4, I'm going to substitute a 4 in for these x's right here. Now, there's an invisible negative 1, okay? And if you want to put that 1 in there, that's great. There's an invisible negative 1. Substitute the 4, square it, minus 3 times 4. Now, just like we said, we have to turn that 4 into a 16 first because the exponent has to come first. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'll multiply the negative 1 times the 16, I'll multiply the 3 times the 4, and then we'll subtract those two numbers to make negative 28. Um, I'm going to slide over a little bit. This time we're going to substitute a negative 5, and it's going to be even trickier, but again, don't be afraid to write that negative 1. Then we're going to put the negative 5 in parentheses, we're going to square it. And every time I make a substitution, I'm always very meticulous and careful to put parentheses around it. Um, we're going to do the exponent evaluation first, so negative 5 gets squared. Negative 5 times negative 5 is positive 25. And then, I'm going to be real patient here, I'm going to multiply negative 1 times 25. I'm going to multiply negative 3 times negative 5. I'm going to add them together, and my final answer is negative 10. All right, our goal here in this next question is to consider the quadratic function f of x equals x squared plus 4x minus 5. And the first thing is we're going to create a table of values over the domain interval from negative 6 is less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to 2. And so we're going to grab our calculators, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, y equals, and I'm going to type in this function. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my table, and I'm just going to start copying down everything that I see. And keep an eye on me here to make sure I don't make any careless mistakes. Um, you can uh, read me the riot act tomorrow if I, if I uh, slip up here. Let's see, negative 5, and then 0, and 7. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take those values, and I'm going to start to plot them here on my graph paper that we imported. Okay, So do the best you can in your notebook. Be very careful. And I'll tell you what, it's really easy to Google graph paper and um, print off a sheet and just kind of cut and tape that into your notebook if you want to take it to the next level tonight. I think that will pay off in the long run. So I've got all my points plotted here, and then I'm going to try to carefully, carefully, carefully connect the dots with a very what we call a smooth continuous function and there's my beautiful parabola now what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you a whole series of questions and I'm gonna throw some uh, arrows up there and I'm gonna ask you a series of questions based on that graph right there so um, although it's gonna kinda slide off my screen hopefully um, you'll still have the full thing on, in front of you in your notebook now my domain just like any other quadratic function is the set of all real numbers or we could say negative infinity to positive infinity because it extends infinitely to the left and infinitely to the right now, in this case, the range, identify your turning point here. Your turning point is right here at negative 2 comma negative 9. So I'm going to say negative 9 is my minimum y value. And my maximum y value is infinity because it extends infinitely up. Notice the bracket on the negative 9, the parentheses on the infinity. We've talked about that before, so hopefully that makes sense. The axis of symmetry is going to bisect the parabola, and it's going to go... I'm going to draw a dotted line right through here. I probably should have picked a different color like red to make it stand out, but uh, hopefully it stands out nonetheless. And that equation right there, now it's a vertical line, so we're, it's going to start with an x, and we're going to say x equals negative 2, and that would be the equation of that vertical line. 
Uh, when is this function increasing? And I'm going to say starting here at this point right here all the way to infinity. So and we're going to use the x coordinates. And I'm going to say from negative 2 to infinity, this function's increasing. And I would accept either a, a bracket or a parenthesis on the negative 2. And that's an argument for our discussion for another day as to why both are acceptable. And then last but not least, another good review question from earlier. When is f of x greater than 0? In other words, when is this function above the x-axis? We've seen this on a couple of quizzes, and we're getting much better at it. And uh, let's, I'm going to scroll up here to the graph and highlight a couple of things. I'm going to say this function is above the x-axis, starting with, I would say this is x equals negative infinity because it's the extreme left, from negative infinity until negative 5, and also from 1 to positive infinity, okay? So that's how I'm going to answer that question. Negative infinity to negative 5. And then again, we'll say union from 1 to infinity, and that's when the graph's above the x-axis. Here's a real uh, squirrely problem, and I'll tell you what, I'm going to try to uh, show you, teach you how to answer all of these questions without plotting these points, but really at the end of the day, if it's too confusing or hard to visualize, there's, there's no law that says you're not allowed to plot these points on some graph paper and get a better view of what's, do, uh, what's going on, because some of us are more visual learners than others. Um, so what they're saying is there's a quadratic function that passes through all of these points. For instance, negative 1 comma negative 10 or 0, negative 2, so on and so on. So imagine yourself plotting those points if you want. And I want to try to find the y-intercept. Now the trick with your y-intercept is that you know x is going to equal 0. So I'm going to scan the table and I'm going to say, okay, right here is the point where x equals 0. So y equals negative 2 is my y-intercept. Now again, the zeros of your function. The zeros is another way of asking you to find the x-intercepts, and that implies that my y values are going to be zero. I'm going to scan the table. I'm going to go up and down the table. I'm looking for y values of zero. I've got one of them right here at x equals one, and I've got another one right here at x equals five. So I'm going to say there's two solutions or two zeros, x equals one and x equals five. Can you find the turning point? And sometimes you can't just by looking at the table. Now remember though, we said that the turning point is going to bisect the two roots. Or and um, what's the average or what's the middle of 1 and 5? And I'm going to say 3. So the turning point is right at 3 comma 4. Now, uh, caution to the wind here, you're not always going to be able to find the turning point just by looking at the table. So be careful, make sure it bisects your two roots. Is the leading coefficient positive or negative? Try to imagine yourself plotting these points. Now what's happening is, let's say we start at negative 10. We increase to negative 2, we increase to 0, we increase to 3, we increase to 4, but that's where we turn around. And then we start to decrease to 3, decrease to 0. So what I'm picturing in my mind is a parabola that increase first, then decrease later. And I'm going to say, therefore, my leading coefficient, or the value of a, is a negative number. So I'm going to say a is less than zero. And last but not least, what is your range? Well, that's going to be dependent on your turning point again. And your, your, um, our y max was a four, right? Because I'm picturing a parabola that opens down. The highest point was a four. So I'm going to say my range was from negative infinity to positive four. Okay. Again, this, this is a, a very uh, tough series of questions here, so if we talk about anything tomorrow, um, this would be a, gr a great topic to review. Well, our last question tonight is a, is a very wordy question. We call it a, a modeling style question. And um, I, I do think it's important, though, to get every detail in your notebook. So whether you've got to just take the time to write down uh, the entire question and every detail that goes with it, or maybe you want to do a screen grab on your computer and just print it off and tape it in and glue it into your notebook, whatever you find easier. Uh, but what we're going to try to talk about is a tennis ball being thrown off the top of a building in such a way that its height relative to time is modeled by the following function, okay? Now, what does that mean, height relative to time? That sounds like just a bunch of gibberish and fancy jargon. Uh, but basically, here's what you need to know. There's a variable t, okay, and that represents all your input values. Um, but in this case, it represents time, which is measured in seconds. 
So we're going to look at t equals 0, t equals 1, t equals 2, etc. And then the letter h, which is uh, represents what you would normally call y, is measuring the ball's height above the ground, and that's measured in meters for this particular problem. So to get us warmed up, um, what I'm going to have you do is I'm, I'm going to have you grab your calculator and um, go to y equals and type in this function. Okay, type in negative 4.9 t squared. Of course, now on your calculator, we're going to use an x on your screen. So replace the t's with x's. Plus 58x plus 27. Okay. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you out here tonight, and I'm going to tell you what my window is. So I hope I didn't ruin the fun for you, um, and I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, but anyway, here's, I think, the window that you can type in to start with. And again, I didn't get that magically, and I promise I did not get that on my first try. In fact, it took me three tries before I got this window that I was really, really happy with. And um, you're going to see a beautiful picture. And uh, we want to evaluate h of 3. Now, what I want you to do to make this as easy as possible is we're going to go to second trace, which is your calculate menu, and you're going to choose number one uh, value. Okay, and uh, you just let x equal 3, hit enter, and let's see what we get. Now, my calculator said that when x equals 3, they said y equals 156.9. Now, remember, x is really just t, right? And the y's is really my h. So how do I interpret the meaning of these values within the context of the question? So I'm going to say at... Uh, uh, t equals 3 seconds, the tennis ball is exactly 156.9 meters above the ground. Okay, so I'll tell you what, um, I think whoever threw this ball must play for the Yankees or something because that is one heck of a throw. Oops, above the ground. Okay. We got that. All right, that's in the books. All right, let's go take a look at another question here. And I want you to, again, using your calculator. Now, we're going to use the maximum feature. So we're going to go second trace, which is going to take you to the calculate menu. Choose number four, which is maximum. And again, now your screen is going to look something like this. All right, and we're going after this point right here. So what we want to do is we're going to set your left bound here. Hit enter once. Then move the cursor to the right and set your right bound here and hit enter twice. And let's see what we get. Now, there's, of course, the calculator is displaying two values. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to round mine to the nearest tenth just to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to say the x value or my t value is 5.9. So in other words, we're saying it took the tennis ball 5.9 seconds before it reached its maximum height here at the peak. Now, the second value, y, uh, it says y equals or h equals 198.6. What does that number mean? Well, that's 198.6 meters. So at its very tallest point, the tennis ball is 198.6 meters above the ground. Wow, what an arm. Sign that kid up to pitch. Um, let's see. All right, part C, last one. Now they said using the zero feature of your calculator. So we're going back to the same menu, second trace. And this time what we're doing is we're going after the x-intercept, a.k.a. the zero. So second zero. Um, I'm going to set my left bound right in this neighborhood, hit enter, and then my right bound is here. Now hit enter twice, and let's see what we get. My calculator is saying that x equals, or t equals, 12.28, so I'm going to round that up to 12.3, that's seconds. So that tells me that it took the tennis ball 12.3 seconds from the moment it left the throwing person's hand to the moment it hit the ground. So that ball was in the air a total of 12.3 seconds. Now your y value or your h, it should be a zero. If your calculator is not displaying zero, it might be displaying something like my calculators. It's saying 1e to the negative 11. That means 1 times 10 raised to the negative 11th power. And that number is so microscopically small, it's essentially zero. It's just what we call the calculator's pixel error. But anyway, uh, great job tonight. Way to hang in there. Hopefully you're feeling very confident about these quadratics and we'll be able to use all these definitions tomorrow. Have a great night and we'll catch you later.